We prayed so much because we want God's grace to really be flowing today. And today is a very, very, very special feast day. We're going to be speaking about Mary. We are at Mary's church. And today is one of the feast days of Mary, Our Lady of Fatima. And not only is it her feast day, but it's the 100 year anniversary to the day of her first apparition at Fatima that happened in 1917. So this is why I said yes to give a talk, even though I'm not a great public speaker. I care and I'm convinced and I believe in this. And so I said yes. And not only that, but I brought you a lot of things. So at least if this talk is terrible, you will have a whole bunch of stuff that you did not have when you first came here. So what briefly, what is Fatima? I have never personally heard anybody talk about it in a way that made my heart stir. When I learned about Fatima, I learned about it from reading this little booklet. It's called Our Lady of Fatima's Peace Plan from Heaven. I was in college when I first got this booklet, and I had never known that the Blessed Virgin Mary could appear to people. I didn't realize that she had messages that are approved by the church. And so I'm going to give each of you a copy of this booklet. And uh, Atulia, would you pass one out to all the young people? And I want you to read it, and before you read, not, not read it now, but when you go home tonight, maybe, or within the next six months, read it prayerfully, and let Our Lady and the Holy Spirit work in your heart. I'll give you a brief overview, because I will be referring back to this frequently, although the talk is not about Fatima. How could I have a talk on the 100-year anniversary of Fatima and not at least give you a little bit of background? So, the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1917, on this day, May 13th, appeared to three children, Francisco, Jacinta, and Lucia, and she had she appeared over the, the course of six months. That's why I said over the next six months, read this little pamphlet, because it's not just about today. It's kind of like a feast that extends for six months. And when she appeared to them, she focused on three ideas. The first one was that it was God's will that we had a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. That it, that's God's plan that she have a strong role in our life. The second aspect was about hell and about death and about suffering. So she told the little children that many souls go to hell because there's nobody to pray for them and to do penance. And she even took these children and gave them an extraordinary vision of hell. So maybe we don't talk about hell that often, but could you imagine if I said, we're going on a field trip, we're going to hell, wow, you, your parents would say, why, why did I send them to the youth group today? That was, they're so shocked, they're so disturbed, they can't sleep at night because of these visions that they had, oh, why did I send them to youth group? Your parents would be very upset. But this is the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary took a seven-year-old the youngest one was seven, and she gave them this extraordinary vision of hell. And she told them that they had to offer everything that they do as a sacrifice so that souls could be saved. These souls are going to hell because not only, obviously, they're not living their, their faith, or they're not living any faith, but there's nobody to pray for them and to do sacrifices, meaning that your prayers and your sacrifices make a difference in the lives of other people, whether you know them or not and whether you see it or not. And then the third thing that she emphasized was the importance of praying the rosary every single day. When I was in college, I was very hungry. I wanted to know what should I do to be a good Catholic? And then the priests and sometimes the religious educators would say, oh, just go to mass on Sunday. And that's all I have to do. There's got to be more. And they say, oh, you can pray a little bit. But they never wanted to impose anything on me because they thought that that would scare me away. But really, the human heart, the soul, yearns for perfection, yearns to be close to God. So when I first read this, I was thinking, wow, the Blessed Mother is telling me that a part of my spiritual regimen every day should be the rosary. And that's not just to priests. That's not just to nuns. She's talking about all Catholics. You're not too busy to pray the rosary, she was saying, no matter what your vocation is. And, and another thing that stood out to me recently is that she's talking to little children and she's talking to poor children. So even if the worst circumstance, even if you can't read or write, or even if you're so great that you are just too busy, that you're just like 
always running around with your business activities. You're not too busy. You're not too poor. You're not too lonely. You're not in a circumstance that does not allow you to pray the most holy rosary. So that was very important. Now, what shocked a lot of people, well, maybe it might shock you, is that, wow, why is Mary coming with such doom and gloom? Why is Mary, the Virgin Mother, supposed to be so happy and peaceful? Why is she taking these little children to hell? Whoa, this is so strange. Actually, it's not strange at all. If you look at the bookends of the Bible, the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, one of the keystones from each of those bookends is there will be enmity. There will be a war between the serpent and the woman in the book of Genesis. At the end, there's a great war that breaks out between the, the evil spirit and the mother of God and all of her children. There's this enmity that takes place and we can examine the Bible from all of this perspective. So the whole purpose of Jesus is salvation. Mary's role is to be at odds with the devil. She is his enemy and she crushes the head of the serpent and it's very humbling for him. So one thing we're going to talk about is we have to talk about if we're going to have a proper understanding of Mary and her role as mother, as mediatrix, as the one who crushes the head of the serpent, we're going to talk about the devil first so that you will know what we're talking about because sometimes in our minds we hear, oh, the devil's scary. Oh, I saw this movie and I can't sleep at night. Oh, mom. Oh, they better not talk about the devil ever again. Don't watch those scary movies. And that's true, you probably shouldn't be watching scary movies because sometimes they make things that aren't true and they lead us astray. So how does the devil work? The, and I have to be clear, the devil's main goal is not to scare you. I'm going to go through some of the ways that the devil works. And I'll start with the most extraordinary, which is the most rare. The devil works through, yes it's true, diabolical possession. That is when, let's say, a person all of a sudden, they're, they lose their free will and now they are being imposed upon by an evil spirit and they are not themselves anymore. Now they're like, I hate you. And they go crazy, just like in the movies. That part is actually true. But that's very, very, very rare. How could this happen to you? Let's think. Well, maybe if you were involved in witchcraft. Maybe if you made a pact with an evil spirit and you said, oh devil, I will do all these things. Please give me this power. That's possible. Maybe somebody put a curse on you and you did all sorts of mortal sins and they, there's, just, there's ways that it can happen. But not to you. If you're a Christian and you're living in the state of grace, that's not going to happen to you. Can it happen? Yes, it can happen. Does it happen very often? No, not very often. Should I be worried about it? No. As long as you are not using witchcraft, you're not using Ouija boards, you're not doing uh, praying to false gods, you're not making pacts with the devil, you're not calling upon evil spirits, you're not murdering people, you're not doing child abuse. All of these grave sins are things that are in greatly evil, 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 then you don't have anything to worry about diabolical possession. But that does exist. One of the things that Hollywood gets wrong is that they make it seem like the priest is afraid. Maybe some priests are afraid. But when there's actual a real exorcism, and that's the solemn rite of a priest going and doing the prayers prescribed by the church, the priest is the one who's in control. He's not really afraid. He's commanding the evil spirit. If anybody's afraid, if anybody's acting out, it is the devil. That's why he's saying, oh, I don't like you, blah, blah, and spitting and cursing and yelling and all sorts of things. Now, that's the extraordinary opportunity, one of the extraordinary. Now, there's other extraordinary ways that the devil can operate. And these are a little bit more common. So one of them is called local infestation. So we have a possession, and then we'll talk about other ways it can impact the person. And then off here on the side, we have a local infestation. What's a local infestation? That's where a location or an object can have an evil spirit attached to it. Maybe you've seen or heard stories of somebody who bought a house, and the house is kind of creepy and you go to sleep you just bought this house but it looks so fancy and then you say okay I'm gonna buy it and then I got a good deal you go to sleep in the house and then in the middle of the night you hear like the sound of this and you're like what and then so you get up and you go downstairs 
and you're looking and all of a sudden the light in the kitchen is on and you're like, okay, and then you go and turn off the light in the kitchen and then you go back in bed and then again you hear, and then you say, I'm staying in bed this time. <laughs> I'm not getting out of my bed. And then you go downstairs in the morning and of course the, the kitchen light is on. And then the next day, you go to sleep, you don't hear anything, but you wake up and you have scratches on your face. Or you're in your room and all of a sudden you hear, and then something got knocked down. Okay, so in that case, if it's being destructive, that is what we would call a local infestation. How can that happen? Well, in houses, for example, this has happened in houses where they commit abortion, houses where they do drug deals, houses where they do prostitution. These places are like a dumpster, spiritual dumpster. And what do dumpsters have? They have a lot of flies. They go there because that's what they're attracted to. So the evil spirits, in places that there's a lot of mortal sin, evil spirits and mortal sin go together. Why? Because mortal sin is a rejection of God. So the evil spirits are attracted to those who reject God and they try to pull them away farther. And they're attracted to locations like this. And so they go there into that house. Or they go into an object. Maybe there is an evil person who does witchcraft and does voodoo and all these things and they put a curse on an object and they bury it in the house somewhere. That's possible. If you have these problems, what should you do? Well, exorcism is only for the possessed. Only for those situations where the soul of the person is completely taken over by, not the soul, the body of the person is completely taken over by the evil spirit, okay? In local infestation, what can you do? You can have your house blessed. You can sprinkle your house with holy water. You put up holy pictures in your house. What else can you do? Pray the rosary in your house. That's what you would do in a, what we call a local infestation. But the key is holiness of life. If evil spirits are attracted to sinful places, you make this place no longer a sinful place. You make it a holy place and they will hate being there. Just like if you have a roach infestation, you clean it up and eventually all these bugs and these insects will go away. Now that's a local infestation. Now there's what I call personal infestation. So if we break, the, the personal infestation is a category that I use. If a priest was dealing in exorcisms and diabolical or deliverance ministry, sometimes they break it into smaller categories and they'll say, well, this one has oppression and this one has obsession and this one is having the dolors or the attacks because they're so holy, God allows the holiest of people like Padre Pio and St. John Vianney to get special attacks to help them grow in holiness and help them to offer sacrifices. But for our sake, we don't need to focus on all these specific categories. Why? Because they're all involving the person. And really, the evil spirits do not follow a set regimen. They can be obsessing one person and then later oppressing them. And what do these terms mean? So basically, a personal infestation is when an evil spirit is attached to an individual and can operate in these various ways. Not possessing them, but more like harassing them. So let's say all of a sudden a person's life becomes very miserable. They lose their job. After they lose their job on their way home, the car breaks. When they get home, after they lost their job and their car is broken, their dog is dead. And then they go to the refrigerator and the refrigerator is broken. Wow! Sometimes when there's so much evil, you have to go and say, did somebody put a curse on me? Okay, that's outward, nothing going on inside the body. Also, there's another thing like an oppression. All of a sudden, I'm so obsessed. I'm so weighed down. I feel like I've got something on my back. Not physical, but like emotional. I feel so heavy. I, I keep obsessing about these thoughts that are dark and evil and I cannot shake them. Well, that can be an evil spirit bothering you. But again, there's a solution and there's no problem and there's a way that we can all have this and we don't have to worry about this if we are living the Christian life. What is another example? Well, I'm going to give you a true story example. I'm going to give you three true story examples. The first one I heard about recently where a woman came to me and said, my niece isn't Christian, isn't Catholic, and she has an imaginary friend. 
And I took my niece to the church one time. And after she went into the church, she didn't like being in the church. And I took her home and she said that her imaginary friend was very angry. And she was, okay, so automatically, imaginary friend, this is way maybe children, evil spirit, they can be talking to their imaginary friend and the evil spirit has an opportunity. Hi, I'm your imaginary friend. Remember me? We talk all the time, right? And, the, and don't ever go back in that church again. This is the imaginary friend saying, okay, if the imaginary friend told you never to go into the church again, I would think your imaginary friend is evil. And then when she went to sleep, the imaginary friend knocked everything off of the, the bed counter. And the imaginary friend scratched her and all these issues. So what is this? I told her, okay, they're, they're, are they Christian? No. What about the, the mom situation? Well, the mom and the dad were having a divorce. And so I said, well, first and foremost, you must have this child baptized. You must give their life to Christ. You must pray for them. It's like, what about a house blessing? Yeah, a house blessing might be good. It might work. But the root problem is Christian life. They have to be living the Christian life. Because if you're living the Christian life, the evil spirits don't mess with you. They don't like you. They don't want to be around you. In a way, they take a beating. They just don't like it. Get away from me. I don't like this. You know what I mean? Now, I'll give you an example from my own personal life. When I was in college... I had, you know, I was converting slowly, but I was still doing all of the sinful things. I was partying, I was looking at bad things on the internet, I was committing all sorts of personal, solitary, and public sins, and I had an addiction to those sins. And one night, in my room, God gave me the grace of being truly sorry for all the sins I committed. I was lying in bed and I was crying. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry for all the sins I've committed. I can't, I need your help. I love you. And then all of a sudden in my room, I heard a voice mocking me saying, Ah, I'm so sorry. God forgive me. Right? And I said, Whoa, St. John Vianney, pray for me. I was so scared. Could you imagine if you're in your room crying to God and then there's a voice that's mocking you? And then the, the moment that I prayed a prayer to St. John Vianney, who I just recently read about, that voice went away. But then the next day, I went back to my room. Imagine, I was, must have been very afraid. If the, the last time you were in your room by yourself, you had a scary thing happen to you, the next time you go in, you're going to be a little bit like, okay. So what I do, I went into my room, I turned the lights on, I had my rosary out, I got this little pamphlet, I said, okay, I'm going to pray this rosary because I'm scared. And so I started and I said, okay, how do you pray this? Uh, all right, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then right before I got to the words, I believe in, I felt a force grab me by the throat, hold me down on the bed and choke me. I, it wasn't that I, it was choking me and I couldn't breathe. It was just a force that was kind of like holding me down and I couldn't speak. My mom was in the other room. I couldn't yell for help. I would, uh, uh. And so in my mind, I was thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do? Instantaneously, the thought in my mind tr said, pray the Hail Mary. But again, I couldn't say any words. So in my mind, I said, Hail Mary. I said those words in my mind. But then outwardly, I tried to get it. I said, Hail Mary. And the moment that I said that, the force got off of me. And it was like, God... <laughs> Uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and is in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And I was praying so fervently, but it went away. And the next day, I went on the internet and I said, okay, what the world happened to me? Okay, devil hold down, Hail Mary, uh, sins, uh, pornography, and all these things. Like, I was Googling everything. And it turned out that there, I, although I had been living in sin my whole life, I had been giving in to my weaknesses. So although I didn't see it, although I did, had no external uh, attacks, I had evil spirits around me, in my room, in my home, and I didn't even know. Why? Because they don't want you to know. They don't want to be made manifest. The, when they do scratches, that, so why, okay, let me, let me take a step back. Why would God allow this? For your good and for my good. They want to remain hidden. Why? Because if they're hidden, they can continue to influence you and peer pressure you and say, oh yeah, 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 go look at that. Nobody's around. You're all by yourself. You can go look at this on the computer. Or they'll say, oh yeah, that guy's a jerk. You should really, you know, 
talk bad about him and spread lies about him. And then you say, yeah, yeah, I should. And they kind of back you up and you have this like little voice on your shoulder influencing you. But when they act out like that, it's because God is trying to help us. So he, they, he allows them to do stupid things like acting out, like holding me down. For me, that was one of the greatest blessings because then I read and I learned, wow, if I have things like New Age books, uh, Buddha statues, false God statues, all of these things are entry points that the devil can use to get into your life. Little hooks that he can use to hold you back. So what was the solution for me? And if you ever feel like there's an evil spirit or you have bad thoughts or you need this, your answer, some people say, oh, exorcism, I need to go get a special exorcism. No, the best exorcism, the best deliverance is confession. Why? Because when you're in mortal sin, you belong to Satan. You're not an heir to the kingdom of God. You're going to hell when you die objectively. That's where you're going. You're in his kingdom. But when you are in the state of grace, when you get freed from your sins through confession, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. You become a member of the body of Christ. You become an adopted child of God the Father. You have Mary as your mother. You have Jesus with you. The evil spirits cannot influence you. The best defense against evil is a holy life. That, that clear? And the greatest enemy of the devil is really the Virgin Mary, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, just as the evil spirits can use cursed objects, just as the evil spirits can use uh, bad pictures, like naked pictures of people, or bad posters of men all muscly on the beach going like with their pecs, and they can tempt you to do or say evil things, God can also use what we call sacramentals, blessed objects, holy reminders to help recall our faith, to help inspire us. Just like we can be inspired to do bad things, we can be inspired by the Holy Spirit to do good things. So, uh, Atulia, if you would pass out, I'm going to give each of you an 8 by 10 of the picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I mentioned at Fatima that, our, that God's will was that we honor the Blessed Mother. And so she even said that the Immaculate Heart should be honored side by side with the Sacred Heart. I'm going to turn my camera a little bit because I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to you. And then, uh, there we go. So when I have these pictures, should I put these pictures underneath? my books for school? Should I put these pictures in the closet? No. What do you need to do? I, I mentioned earlier local infestation, protecting your house. Take these and if you don't put them in the most, if you already have holy pictures in your house, put these in your room in a prominent place where you're saying, God, I might be a sinful person sometimes, but I want you to be the king of my house. Mary, I want you to be the queen of my house. My room belongs to God. And then there'll be no room for Satan because he'll say, this house is taken already. They have claimed Jesus as their king and Mary as their queen. How else can these pictures work? Well, there's a picture of the Sacred Heart. There's a promise from the Sacred Heart of Jesus to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque that those who have an image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus will have peace in their homes, and wherever Jesus' sacred heart is honored. That's important. But also, look at these pictures. When you're looking at them, Jesus is saying, I give you my heart. I love you. Won't you love me? Look, he's saying, come on. He's got his hand out like, come on. Won't you love me? And then Mary, the same thing. She's saying, I'm giving you my heart. Won't you love me? Won't you pray the rosary? Won't you wear the scapular? Come on. I love you. And so what, why would this benefit us so much? Because sometimes I want to do bad things. We all want to do bad things. We all have concupiscence. We all have a natural inclination to sin. And so you can walk by this picture a hundred times, but one day you're on your way to do something bad or you have a bad idea in your head and you're walking by and you're like, 
yeah, I'm going to tell that fool off. And then you walk by and for some reason, this image is like looking at you and you're like, why is Jesus looking at me? And then you walk by and you, you kind of see in his eyes and he's saying, don't do that. And you're like, I want to. Don't do that. I love you. Can't you love? Can't you just love him? Why do you have to be so angry all the time? Jesus, stop that. And, and it's like he's talking to you because God is using the holy image to speak to you. Similarly, when there are bad images, maybe on the computer, and you say, I shouldn't look at that. I shouldn't look up there. But then you kind of feel like you got to look at it and you can't help yourself. Similarly, God, using holy images and holy objects, will say, come on, look at me. I don't want to look at you, Jesus. Look at me and do what I tell you. Fine, I'll do it. I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't mean to yell at you earlier. Are you happy, Jesus? Yes, I'm happy. Was that so hard? No. Okay. And then you're having this conversation. You say, man, I'm going crazy. But you're not going crazy. The reality is, is that God is using you. The Holy Spirit is working in your life. Now, earlier, so this is the first of the sacramentals that I'm giving you. Earlier, I said that the Virgin Mary and Satan have enmity. He hates the, Satan hates the Virgin Mary more than any other creature on earth. Why? Because she crushed his head. It was through Mary that Jesus entered the world. So the devil is always going to attack the Virgin Mary whenever he's attacking the Catholic faith. When people want to attack the Catholic faith, they break statues of Mary. When our Protestant brothers and sisters, they, when they accuse us, they say, you Catholics worship Mary. You Catholics worship her statues. Where in the Bible does it say to do this? And they keep attacking that and attacking that and attacking that. And you say, man, and it doesn't really make any sense. Honoring somebody's mother should come naturally. If we love Jesus, it's very natural that we're thankful for his mother and that we honor her. That's very normal. So why would the Protestants be against the Virgin Mary? That doesn't make any sense unless the devil, the evil spirits, are the ones who are encouraging this negative behavior towards the Virgin Mary because she is so powerful. So... I'm going to go through scripture. This is going to be the most boring part of the talk. I'm warning you. But you have to suffer through it. Why? Because, and I might be yelling at you. So why is he yelling so much? Because there is a little voice here on your shoulder that will say, don't pray the rosary. Or, yeah, that's true. Mary isn't in the Bible. Or, yeah, uh, don't wear the scapular. That's kind of a goofy thing and it's kind of itchy. So I might be yelling at you, but it's because I'm yelling at the, the, the arguments that might come into your mind later. So Mary in Scripture. The problem is, is that Protestants don't know how to read the Bible. In all honesty, I love them. My wife's family's Baptist. I love them. But in all honesty, they don't know how to read the Bible. Why? Because the Bible must be read in two parts. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament together. They must be read in line with one another. They must be read with the history and the tradition of the Catholic Church who compiled the Bible. So they say, where is that in the Bible? Well, first and foremost, you have, we have an issue. Why is the Bible so important to you? Where did the Bible come from? Did it come out of the sky? Did it write itself? Did Jesus write the Bible? No, the Catholic Church compiled and preserved the, the Bible. But it is actually in there. Everything that the church teaches can be supported from Scripture. And I'll give you an example of why it's important to know that in Scripture you have to take everything in context. So, for example, in the, in the book of Genesis, we, we see, we all know the story, there was seven days and there was light and darkness and God created the heavens and the earth and the waters and yada yada. Okay, we know this. Also, in the Gospel of John, he would say, in the beginning, so the book of Genesis starts off in the beginning, the Gospel of John starts off in the beginning. The people who are hearing the Bible for the first time, they don't have a written book that they're reading. They're hearing it, and they remember it. Just like if I were to sing, Akuna Matata, or I would sing a song from a movie, Frozen, everybody, I would just have to say one line, and you would automatically remember what movie I'm talking about, right? Hakuna Matata, Lion King. All right, a whole new world. Okay, Aladdin. We all know this. Similarly, the old people in the older days, in the first century, second century, first time they're hearing Christianity, whenever somebody would say, and in the beginning, they would say, oh, he's talking about the book of Genesis. 
And so that's called the mind in the Gospel of John. You'll notice, then John says, and then the light and the darkness. Oh yeah, that's just like in the book of Genesis. And then the Holy Spirit was over the waters. Oh yeah, just like in the book of Genesis. And then it would say, and then there the Lord was, and on the next day. Okay, that's in the book of Genesis. And the next day. And then the next day Jesus did this. And on the next day Jesus was over here. Similarly, in the book of Genesis, it was saying, and then on the next day God created this. And on the next day God created that. So automatically, the original hearers of this gospel are calling to mind everything in the book of Genesis. And then in the gospel of John, it says, and then on the third day, he had already mentioned four days. So four plus three is seven. Oh, that's like the book of Genesis. There's seven days. What happens in the book of Genesis on the seventh day? God rests. In the gospel of John, what happens on the seventh day? There's a wedding feast, a banquet, a union, a celebration. What happens at the wedding feast of Cana? Jesus multiplies wine, multiplies water, turns water into wine. In the, in the book of Genesis, what happens? Eve tempts Adam, right? She says, you want this fruit. So Eve gets Adam to do the first sin. In the Gospel of John, Mary gets Jesus to do his first miracle. Eve believed an evil angel and brought death into the world. Mary believes the angel Gabriel and brings life and grace and holiness into the world. So are we, there's a parallel, Adam and Eve, Jesus and Mary. But we have to be able to understand that the scriptures have to be seen together. There's other parallels like the Ark of the Covenant and the Virgin Mary. The Ark of the Covenant was a sacred vessel that was made of the purest gold to specific qualities and instructions. The Virgin Mary was pure and sinless. What did the Ark of the Covenant have in it? It had the rod of Aaron the high priest. It had the bread that came down from heaven. What did Mary have in it? She had the bread of eternal life. She had the high priest Jesus. The other one had the Word of God in stone in the Ten Commandments. Mary has the Word of God in flesh inside of her womb. So we can see all of these parallels. I'm not going to go into them because you're, you're not going to remember them. But just know that they exist and that they are present. Also we have in the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel says to the Virgin Mary, Hail, full of grace! When somebody's full of grace, that means maximum grace, that means they have no sin. So even before the Holy Spirit comes upon the Virgin Mary, the angel, a messenger from God, is addressing the Virgin Mary as being full of grace. So there are so many scriptural references, but I'm going to only do one more for you. So at the wedding feast of Cana, people will say, Why do you pray to Mary? Why do you ask Mary to help you? I don't know. That's not in the Bible. Okay, if you say so. You say, okay, whatever you say, you're right, I'm wrong, I don't know anything. Okay, no. Why do we do it? It's in the Bible. First of all, Jesus is a king from the line of King David. That's why they keep saying, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David. In the line of King David, King David had so many wives. Who's the queen? Which one? Which one of my many wives will be the queen? If I pick one as my favorite, all the other wives are going to hate me. So what, who's the queen? The mother. So if Jesus is a king from the same line, that means the queen, he's gotten a woman in his life. The mother is the only woman in his life. The mother is the queen. The role of the queen from the line of King David was to intercede for the people. The role of Mary is to intercede for the people. Why is that in the Bible? Ah! Okay. In the Gospel of John at the wedding feast of Cana, they had no more wine. Mary is there in scripture going to Jesus and saying, they have no more wine. Jesus says, woman, what business is this of mine? Our Protestant friends and even ourselves will say, man, he sure is being rude to Mary. No, she's the new Eve. Adam called Eve woman. Jesus, the new Adam, is calling Mary the new Eve woman. And then Jesus says, what business is this of mine? My hour has not yet come, a.k.a. It's not my plan. It's not God's plan. If, if I prayed to God for something and he said, no, it's not my plan, I would just drop it and say, okay. Mary didn't just drop it. She said to the waiters, do whatever he tells you. And Jesus worked his first miracle. So that shows us we want something. 
I want, and, and think about what, what they're asking for. This isn't even that important. This isn't about salvation. This is about more wine at a party, okay? And so by working his first miracle, it, it begins Jesus' journey towards the cross. So Mary is the one who starts Jesus' journey towards the cross by getting him to work a miracle that it wasn't his hour to perform yet. So if there's something that even if it's not God's will, you go to the Virgin Mary from Scripture, she will help you to get it from the Bible, the first miracle. And she's also a great example of what? Of perseverance. If you look at the way Jesus treats people in the Bible, he's not very nice. Like, he's a good man, but he's a not very nice at first. He seems to be always testing people. People will say, Jesus, heal my so-and-so. Jesus, do this. And what does Jesus respond? But you're a Samaritan woman. I'm not going to throw the pearls before swine. Whoa, this is very rude. But what does she do? She says, but Lord, even the dogs get the scraps from the table. Aha, she's got faith. You go be healed now. And that kind of routine happens time and time again. Somebody asks Jesus for something. You people always want miracles. You people always want a sign. Yeah, yeah. And then Jesus, they persist. And then Jesus says, okay, it's done. And Mary is a perfect example of that. He blew her off, treated her almost as like he was saying no. And then she said, in a way, she said, no, 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 no. I'm your mother. He's going to do what I tell you. That's basically, so that's scripture there. Then we have the history of the, well, let's go for a little bit of theology. So God likes to do things the same. If God brought Jesus into the world once through Mary, he's going to continue to bring Jesus into the world through Mary. This is very simple. If Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and I want more Holy Spirit, I should become more like Mary. The more Mary in you become, when, a, when the Holy Spirit sees a soul that is like the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit can't help but fly there. She's the exact opposite of Satan. Satan was at such a high place, and because of his pride, he fell. Mary is so lowly, so humble, and because of her humility, she's been exalted to the highest place. The devil hates her so much because he was brought to nothing by a 13-year-old girl. You think, oh, I'm Satan, I've been created the greatest. Ah, ah. And then you're defeated by a 13-year-old girl. No offense, ladies, but that's why. But, and that's re one of the reasons why the evil one hates women. If you think about it, who did the evil spirit in the Garden of Eden tempt first? He didn't go to Adam, he went to the woman. Maybe because he heard that a woman was going to have his place in heaven, that he attacked the woman first. Maybe he thought, this must be the woman that's going to take my place, and he attacked her first. So women, you have to be careful, because the evil spirit wants to degrade you. And men, what was the fault of men? Men did, Adam did not protect the woman. Adam didn't say, get out of here with your lies. Get out of here with your falsehoods. He allowed Eve to be used by the evil spirit, and then he, he fell to Eve's offerings. Also, in the lives of the saints, we see that the greatest saints were the ones who were closest to the Virgin Mary. Mary desires one thing, and that is to bring souls to Jesus. So if you stay with Mary, you will always have Jesus in your life. If you look at all the apostles, they loved Jesus. Imagine if you could be with Jesus every single day for three years, seeing all the miracles. Many times we say, oh, if I could only be there, I would believe. I could see miracles, I would believe. The apostles saw miracles. The apostles saw Lazarus come from the dead, and still they abandoned him. Except for one apostle didn't abandon Jesus the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, the one whom Jesus gave to his, his mother as his own son. He said, mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And they keep calling him the beloved disciple because really, if we want to be God's real disciple, we've got to be close to Mary. She will make sure that we make it all the way to the foot of the cross. Too often we think that a Marian devotion is only for women or only for old ladies who are in the church all the time. And that's the exact opposite. The reason why those old ladies and those old people are still in church with their rosaries and their Marian devotion is because Mary has kept them faithful to God. 
and kept the devil out of their lives. And throughout the history of the church, I mentioned that all of the greatest saints, if they were faithful to God, it was because they had a great devotion to the Virgin Mary. And we need to do that. We need to have that in our life. And so that's why I gave you, first I gave you a picture of Jesus and Mary, yes, because Jesus is the king, Mary is the queen side by side, Mary's leading us to Jesus, but I'm also going to give you other stuff, sacramentals, tangible items that we can have, that throughout history, Mary's always brought people to Jesus Christ. At, at Pentecost, Mary was there with the apostles, praying with them, asking the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Why? Because she already had the Holy Spirit. If you want the Holy Spirit, you're going to get it at your confirmation, yes, if you haven't already been confirmed, but be more Marian. I have many friends who used to be in the charismatic movement, and then the charismatic movement where they were at kind of dies out. Why? Because they lose sight of authentic theology, that the Holy Spirit would do a couple things for them, and then it'd kind of die out and they would see no more miracles. If you want to see miracles, if you want the Holy Spirit to be active in your life, be devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So throughout the history, not only at Pentecost, but Mary would appear throughout the history of the church and church approved apparitions. And every time she did, conversions would happen, miracles would happen. So for example, we have this image of Our Lady of Guadalupe and we see it in the back of all the trucks of all the lawnmowers and all the Hispanics. They have all these uh, Guadalupe images and they might not even understand what that's about. That the true meaning of that image is conversion to Jesus Christ. That there Mary said, I, why are you worried? Am I not with you who I am, your mother? This, was, this vision, this apparition that happened in Mexico was at the exact same time as what was going on in the Protestant Reformation. During the Protestant Reformation, millions of people were leaving the Catholic Church and making their own church based on the Bible alone, which they got from the Catholic Church, which they don't even accept that. And at the same time, Mary is in the new world making 8 million converts just with one apparition. And Mary, whenever she appears, she always uses signs, wonders, and she always leaves something tangible. So let's start talking a little bit about these tangible objects. So the first thing that I'm going to give you is a brown scapular. If you'll make sure that everybody gets one. Thank you. So we've all heard a lot of good homilies in our life. We've all heard good talks that were very inspiring. What I'm going to show you and share with you now is more important than if you ever heard 50 good talks in a row. This will do more for your life and more for your soul than hearing the best speakers, the most inspiring speakers. Why? Because the Virgin Mary, like, so I, I work in evangelization. Guess who's a better evangelizer than me? The Virgin Mary. She's smart. She always wins. She crushes the head of the serpent. And so her tools for evangelization and bringing souls to Jesus Christ are the absolute best. And I'm going to give you these sacramentals in order of greatest, best. No, actually, I'm wrong. So that went off to remind me. I'm going to give you these sacramentals in order of easiest, to hardest. What do I mean easiest to hardest? I'm going to give you the most basic Mary and sacramental first, the easiest to do, and then I will go to the hardest. The first one, the most easy thing to do is the brown scapular. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to a man named Simon. We now call him Saint Simon Stock. And she said to him, receive this garment before it was bigger. It was like a full thing that goes over the body. Receive this garment. Anybody who wears this shall not suffer eternal fire. Well, is this some sort of a magic charm? Superstition object? Some holy, a holy object? Well, let me clarify. Anybody who wears this garment as a sign of their consecration to the Virgin Mary shall not suffer eternal fire. Let me explain what that means. So anybody who says to Mary, I consecrate myself to you, what does that mean? That means, Mary, I want to go to heaven. I want to serve your son, Jesus Christ. I want to be 
in heaven with him for all of eternity. Please help me to do that. I give myself to you as your child for you to help me grow in holiness. Who's the first person to do that? Jesus. Jesus was the first person to give himself to Mary and say, Mary, be my mother. Watch over me, protect me, take care of me, guide me, and provide for me. That's what you're saying. So she's saying, if you wear this as a sign that Mary's your mother and that she's going to help you get to heaven, that she promises you won't suffer eternal fire. How, well, I'll answer your questions at the end. How would this work? She would do this as an advocate. Just as the wedding feast of Cana, she stood between the, the, the wedding guests and Jesus and said, please do me this favor. That's one way. By you giving yourself to Jesus through Mary, that's what saves you. It's not necessarily that it's a piece of cloth. It's what it represents. Similarly, for example, I'm married. I gave myself to my wife. I said, honey, I'll do the best. And, and this is what marriage means. I'm giving myself completely to you. You give yourself completely to me. My, my goal is to try and get you to heaven. Your goal is to try to get me to heaven, to raise children, to get them to heaven. That happened at marriage. This ring is not my marriage. This ring is a sign of my marriage. I wear it as a sign of that. Similarly, I wear this as a sign of the promise that I've given myself to Mary. How else can this work? Let's say, for example, Mary's intercessory powers can obtain your conversion. I'll give you a scenario. Let's pretend that your uncle, Johnny, is in the hospital. And Johnny doesn't go to church. And Johnny hates priests because they're so hypocritical. But really, Johnny has sins that he's done and he's, they're bothering him inside. And he doesn't want to confess them to the priest because he's embarrassed and he's got so much anger inside of him. And so you say, Johnny, please go to the priest, you're dying. He says, I hate priests. He said, please, uncle, will you at least wear the brown scapular, please? And you're crying. Fine, give it to me. And he puts it on. And then the next day you come back to see him at the hospital and the door's closed. And he says, oh, sorry, sir, you can't go in there. Why? What's wrong with Johnny? Oh, he's going to confession. What? So some, the, well, the priest came by, he said, is everything okay? And then Johnny started crying. Well, so our lady is keeping her promise. Nobody who wears the scapular shall suffer eternal fire. It doesn't always mean that she's going to stand at the gates of hell and say, my son, don't let him go in. That means that she can obtain the grace of conversion. That the smallest act of faith, by putting it on, it's a symbol of faith. So Uncle Johnny rejected God in every way. But this minor sliver could have saved him from fires of hell for all of eternity. That's another way. Uh, what's another way that the scapular could work? You could be in the car and you're driving. Next thing you know, you get into a car accident. You're pinned down. You're unconscious. And then a priest drives by and he sees it and he goes and looks and he sees the scapular out. And he says, this person's a Catholic. And oh, they still got a pulse. Lord, if you can hear me, give your sins to Jesus. I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you were kept alive long enough, one, to hear, have your confession, your conditional confession, your conditional absolution. You were alive long enough and the priest saw the scapular to show that you're a Catholic. That's one way that it can work. Another way, it's okay. Another way that the devil doesn't, because we're about to get to the very important part that the devil doesn't like. Oh, and you know what I forgot to do? This is what I forgot to do before my talk. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Everybody in TV land, sorry. <laughs> oh, I forgot to do this one thing. Lord, forgive me. That's why we have some interference. So what's another way that it can work? Well, one way that it worked in my life, because I was a sinner. Remember I told you, the devil was on my shoulders. He was like, I was on his team. But then he knew that he was losing me. When I pulled out that rosary, he got desperate because he knew I was going to marry. Well, what was the really the turning point? I can attribute it to the brown scapular. Many, I put this on and I had no idea really what it meant. I was wearing it as insurance. And there'd be times where I was about to do something sinful and I'd be scratching and I'd say, 
what's, what's all this scratching? And then I'd say, what? what? And then, I'd, oh, it's my scapular. And then I'd say, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing this. Or I'd be about to curse at somebody or do some other maybe pleasurable sin that is very tempting. And then my scapular would come out. And I'd say, uh, oh. And it's a picture of the Virgin Mary. So imagine you're about to do some sinful pleasure. And then all of a sudden, there's a, somehow out of your shirt comes a picture of the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus. You say, maybe I should stop. <laughs> okay. That's another way that it can work. But what I want for you is I want you to wear this every single day of your life and not take it off, except for in the mornings. So I wear mine all the time. I do take it off to take a shower, and then I put it back on and I kiss it as a sign that I, 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 want, I want Mary to help me. You have to keep a promise, the promise being that you're going to try. You're going to fail. Everybody fails. We're all going to sin. But I'm trying. And I'm wearing this as a sign that Mary, work with me, help me. As long as you're doing that, I promise you, the Virgin Mary will always be with you, will always protect you. This is a sign that you're her property and that the devil has no part in your life. So even if you failed, you're dying. You're in the street. You haven't lived a good life, but you're wearing your scapular. This is a sign saying, Mary, I'm a failure. Please help me. Now, I teach a variety of different people at the church I go to. And some people are really tough guys, and I have to yell at them. You guys are not all these tough guys. I'm still going to yell at you. Put on your scapular! Open it. Put it on your shoulders. Tuck the square underneath your shirt. And tuck the front square in the front underneath your clothes. Go ahead and do it. Tuck it in. Come on, you'll feel better when you do it. Tuck it in, tuck it in. I'm already wearing one. I'll wear another one just so that you'll feel better. Okay, look, I'm doing it too. Tuck it in. Why are we tucking it in? Because if it's outward, we're more tempted to take it off. Oh, it's caught on my microphone. We're more tempted to take it off. So I yell at the tough guys that don't want to do it, and I say, you're an idiot. And then they, I know then afterwards I regret calling people idiots. Because Jesus said, call no man fool, call no man raka, yada, yada, you're going to burn in hell for doing this. Okay, I'm sorry, Lord, but that person is just so dumb for not wearing the scapular. Why? Because imagine they go outside and then they're hit by the car and the scapular's in their pocket. And then God says, hey, man, what? I, but God, I got the scapular. Hey, you didn't put it on. Well, uh, I'm too cool. <laughs> No, you fool. I gave you every opportunity. This guy kept yelling at you, put it on, put it on, put it on, put it on, put it on. And you did not do it. So you know what I do? They still don't listen. I give them a little meditation on hell. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a little meditation on hell. So let's imagine what hell might be like. Let's imagine the worst circumstances. So uh, nothing that I'm about to say can actually compare to what hell is really, really like. These are just our imaginings. The worst thing we can imagine, hell is infinitely worse. So uh, the worst thing that I can imagine is having my skin peeled off of my body, my eyes plucked out, my hair plucked out, my ears drowning, being crunched in a little box, freezing, not being able to breathe. Okay, we get the point. <laughs> Seeing the worst sight that I'd want to scratch my eyes out of my sockets just not to hear them. Hearing the worst sound that I'd want to pull my ears off. Okay, so, but that's a little extreme. Let's just focus on fire, the sense of touch, okay? I could stand, if I had to, I would be willing to be burned for a second, if I had to, if that meant somebody was going to be helped. Like if my children were stuck in the house and I was going to try and save them, I would be willing to run through the fire. I'd be willing to burn for five minutes. I could stand to burn for maybe, you know, 10 minutes. Okay, oh, it's going to be terrible, but I'll do it, right? But could you imagine, and that's terrible, but the reason I could do it is because I know it's going to end. Imagine just, we can't even stand a little match burning our finger for one second. Imagine our entire body being consumed by fire, not just for one week, not just for one month, not for one year, but forever. All of these worst torments, they never, ever stop. 
forever. It never stops. 50 years, you're just going to be screaming and burning and rolling and tearing. It's absolutely the worst thing possible. And if we could see what hell was really like, that's what changed these little children. The little children, Jacinto and Francisco, Jacinta and Francisco, the youngest children who saw this vision of hell, they died when they were children and they were canonized saints today because they were absolutely transformed when they saw what hell was really like and, that, and how terrible it was and that people actually go there, they changed their life completely because they didn't want anybody to go. And one of the greatest torments is knowing that I didn't have to go. I chose hell based on my three minutes of pleasure that I chose. Imagine all the sins that we do. They only last for such a short time. But hell, the consequence lasts forever. Another torment is knowing that I could have gone to heaven easily. All I could do is confess my sins to the priest and say, Father, forgive me. And to know that all of my eternity of hell could have gone away in three minutes, that causes such turmoil. And then to think, I could have saved my soul, even if that meant I was going to be in purgatory for a long time, had I only said, Mother Mary, be with me, protect me, I entrust myself to you, I wear the scapular as a sign of that. Put on your scapular. Don't be a fool. Wear the scapular. I used to teach, and I used to have a lot of holy students, and then some of them went astray, and they would come to me asking for help. And I don't know why they would ask me for help because my advice was always the same. All the things that I'm going to tell you today and that I've been talking about today, that's all the advice that you'll ever need. And I said, well, do you have your scapular on? No. Well, of course. Of course you're going to give in to all the sins because you have no protection from the wickedness and snares of the devil. Mary is your bodyguard. She is your armor. She is your protection. If you give up your Mary in devotion, you're going to be led astray. Mary protects you. She keeps you close to Jesus. This is the most basic. And, and actually, wearing the scapular is, in my opinion, nobody has ever said this before, but I've thought about this, this is actually a visible sign of the Hail Mary. Why? Because I'm wearing this only because Mary is the mother of God. I'm wearing this only because Mary is full of grace. I'm wearing this only because I want protection now and at the hour of my death. This is the tangible Hail Mary that you're wearing over your body. The Hail Mary is what? It's what brought the end of the rule of Satan. It's what brought Jesus Christ into the world. And I'm wearing that sign on my body. It's powerful. I promise you, if you wear this, you have nothing to fear. I sleep in peace at night. I sleep in peace at night for many reasons, because I've got things all over me. I've got rosaries here. I've got holy objects in my pockets. Let's see what's in my pockets. The next thing we're going to talk about is a, a miraculous medal. I wear a miraculous medal. I carry a giant miraculous medal on me at all times. I've got, uh, let's see what I got in here. I've got like probably two miraculous medals in this bunch of medals that I'm wearing. You laugh, but trust me, if you were ever choked by the devil, you'd be wearing a lot of medals too. <laughs> All right, so I asked Athulia to prepare a little video on YouTube about the origins of the miraculous medal so that you don't just have to see me talk and hear me talk straight the whole time. So we'll watch a short little clip if you want to pu pull it up. Wake up, the Blessed Virgin is waiting for you. The Blessed Virgin is waiting for you.
This is the Blessed Virgin. This is the Blessed Virgin. wishes to charge you with a mission. You will have much to suffer, but you will rise above this suffering by reflecting that what you do is for the glory of God. You will know what the good God wants. You will be contradicted, but have no fear. You shall have grace. Have confidence. Do not be afraid. The times are evil. The whole world will plunge into every kind of misery. But come to the foot of the altar. There, graces will be shed upon all, great and small, who ask for them. I shall be with you. I always have my eye upon you. I will grant you great graces. The moment will come when the danger will be extreme. It will seem as if all is lost. At that time, I will be with you. Have confidence. You will recognize my coming and the protection of God. Have confidence. Confidence. Holy Mother, this ball that you see represents the whole world and each person in particular. These are symbols of the grace I shed upon those who ask for them. Have a medal struck after this model. All who wear it shall receive great graces. They should wear it around the neck. Graces abound for all who wear it with confidence. 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 Okay, so she's handing out the miraculous medal. I will recap what you saw. In 1830, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to a nun named Catherine, named Catherine Labore. She was a nun in France, and she told Catherine to have a medal made after the image she, she saw. It was the Virgin Mary standing on the earth with her feet on the head of a snake, crushing the head of the snake, with rays coming out of her hands, with the words around the image saying, O oh Mary, conceived without sin, Pray for us who have recourse to you. On the back of that, she flipped over, the image flipped over. There was a cross with an M at the bottom of the cross with 12 stars around it with two hearts. She said that anybody who wore this medal with, around their neck with great confidence would receive great graces. So I said that the first sacramental that I gave you the scapular was the easiest. This one is level two, a little harder. This was originally called the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, but because there were so many miracles, they started calling this the Miraculous Medal. So if you need miracles, if you want miracles, I need miracles. I want miracles. So I wear the miraculous medal. And then the key she said was, those who wear it with great confidence, confide, with faith, those who wear it with great confidence. That's the key. Why would there be miracles associated with this? So 
Why did Jesus work miracles? Because he was merciful? Yes. But why else? To prove a point, to, to proclaim a truth. When the apostles would go out and preach and teach in order to show that, hey, what I'm saying is true, in the name of Jesus, you in the back there, get up, you're healed. And then they say, whoa, what this guy is saying must be true because he just raised the guy from the ground. Okay, similarly, the, the metal has truths involved to it. What is the truth? The metal, Mary is stepping on the head of the serpent. That is one of the truths. Mary standing on top of the earth with her hands outstretched, with graces coming out. Because one of Mary's roles, besides advocate, which we talked about when she was interceding at the wedding feast at Cana, is that she's the mediatrix of all graces. That means everything that Jesus wants to give us, everything that God wants to give us, comes through the Virgin Mary's hands. Similarly, if Jesus is the head of the church, Mary is the neck, and we are the members of the body of Christ. So what is the greatest grace given to humanity? Jesus. How did the greatest grace come to us? Through Mary. So we see here in her hands rays coming out. And those rays, she said, symbolized all the graces that were flowing to humanity. That all we have to do is ask for them. And in the prayer itself, O Mary, conceived without sin, that means she's immaculate, pray for us who have recourse to thee, which and we're asking her to pray for us, means that she's our advocate. At the back, we have Mary at the foot of the cross. It wasn't just Jesus who suffered on the cross. Mary had a sword pierce her own heart. So some people would say that she cooperated with our redemption. Throughout her entire life, she cooperated with our redemption by bringing Jesus into the world, by raising Jesus, by suffering alongside Him. That's why we have at the bottom the two hearts. So Mary is also what some people would say, co-redemptrix. Not that she redeems us, but that she cooperated with our redemption. And then the twelve stars are the twelve apostles. So all of this is like a mini catechism. And so when we wear our faith outwardly, confidently, that's where the graces will flow. And this is a reminder to be confident in the Virgin Mary, in her powerful intercession, in divine providence. So how would this work? Let's say, for example, you have an exam. Oh, maybe you want to get into a school. You have to take your SATs. You pray the rosary before your SATs. You wear your medal. You could do two things. Some people get so worried. You get so stressed out. What am I going to do? It's going to be so hard. I can't sleep. I'm so excited. Oh, what am I going to do? I'm so stressed out. Or you kiss this and you say, I'm not going to worry about it. I put it in your hands. I'm going to do the best I can. I offer it all to God and whatever happens, happens. Who's going to do better? The one who's so stressed, I can't, I can't even think, my head hurts so bad. Or the one who lets it go and lets God, as they say. But really we're saying the Blessed Virgin Mary will go to us for God, right? With great confidence, next thing you know, you did so well. I'll tell you a little story about myself, although it's embarrassing. When I was in college, I not only, well, it's not that I cheated, I forged a document. If you, when you go to college and you cheat on an exam and they catch you, chances are you are going to be kicked out of school. What are the consequences if you cheat on an exam and they catch you? Uh, you're kicked out of the college. You're kicked <laughs> out of the college. Gone! Boo! Kicking out! All right. I didn't cheat on an exam. Maybe, maybe. I didn't, I didn't cheat on an exam. <laughs> but I wanted to get out of a course. And my counselor, my academic advisor, wasn't around. His name was Dr. Colvin. And so I had the form. I was tempted. And I said, all I need is his signature. He doesn't really care anyways. But then in my conscience, I was saying, but that's forgery. And I said, I have an idea. His name is Colvin. I'll sign it called this, and therefore I am not forging his signature. Well, they considered that forging anyways, and they caught me. And you know what that means? Forging a signature is very serious. They were going to kick me out of the university. At the time, I was wearing one of the little medals underneath my shirt, hidden. And in my conscience, I remember reading in the little pamphlet that I had to have great confidence. So I said, all right, let's make a deal. I'm desperate. 
I will wear a bigger medal. And I had a big one. I had a big old one. I don't wear it anymore because people are like, whoa, that's scary. So I just wear And then plus, it's like, why are you doing that? Just wear the oval. It was round. Anyways, I said, Lord, I will wear... And I don't remember if it was, I was wearing that circle one, but I was wearing a bigger one. I said, Lord, I will wear the miraculous medal outside if you'll help me. Keep me in school, please. I made a mistake. So I said, okay, Mary, here we go. We're going in. And I went into the, the dean of the school, and he said, Mr. Castillo, please take a seat. And I said, yes, sir. He said, what you did was very foolish. And I said, sir, let me just be clear here. Not only was it foolish, it was dumb. It was wrong. I am an idiot. I am the biggest fool ever. And I just kept... Uh, saying derogatory things about myself. And then he said, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> okay, I get it. And I said, sir, please forgive me. He said, I don't ever want to see you in this office again. And I said, because you're kicking me out of school and so you're never going to see me in this office again? No, I mean, don't ever get caught doing anything ever bad again. And I said, so I can stay in school? I don't ever want to see you again, okay? I said, yes, sir. So if I go to class tomorrow, my name will still be, get out of my office. And then I knew, wow, Mary, this really works. So what, maybe what happened? Maybe he was planning on kicking me out. And maybe he saw that I was wearing this medal. Maybe he had a grandma who wore this medal. And he says, that reminds me of my grandma. I cannot kick... <laughs> I, can, I cannot kick out somebody who reminds me of my grandma. That's possible. One time I was in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I think that's where it was. And I was giving a presentation. And I was working on the presentation all night long. Like, oh, I, was I pulled an all-nighter. Working on a presentation about Catholics in the media. It had all these cool effects in the slideshow. Transition, star transition. And right when I finished, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I hit save. And then I saw somebody's hand grab my cell phone. And then I was like, what? And I went like this. And there was a gun on my head. And if I were to, when there's an object hitting your head and you don't see what it is, what do you do? You say, what's this on my, you hit it. And so I hit it and I realized it was a gun. And I was looking at the barrel of the gun and I just was like starting to fight with the guy who had the gun. But I didn't mean to. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And then I said in Spanish, because I don't speak Portuguese, I said, No matar! No matar! Ave Maria! And I started doing all these Latin prayers, right? <laughs> but the whole time I was doing these Latin prayers, and I, was, I, I said, Crux sacra sit mihi lux, nunc draco sit mihi dux. I was saying a deliverance prayer from St. Benedict Medal. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And for some reason, he should have shot me. I know he should have shot me. I don't know why, but I was expecting the bullet to go through my chest. I was just, I was laying there and I was thinking, this is it. Oh God, I don't want to go out this way, but whatever. And I was thinking mainly about my son. And then afterwards, he didn't shoot me. And you should, if I were him and somebody's got my gun, I would shoot them. Especially because he was already robbing the whole hotel and taking my laptop. And he didn't. And a part of that, I attribute to me having protection of the Virgin Mary. And I, then I think back, and it's maybe he saw my medal. Maybe he saw that my laptop had a sticker of Mary and my cell phone. My cell phone, I don't know where I put it, but I keep holy pictures on my cell phone. And I really believe that I had special protection and that that's why I did not get killed. And the, the miraculous medal, I say it's more difficult to wear than the scapular. Why? Because it's outwardly. So the more difficult things become to do for an individual, the greater the blessing that the Virgin Mary gives to it. Why would she do that? Why would she want me to wear something outwardly? Because this gives testimony to my faith. Many times, so when I wear the scapular underneath, I feel it. It's a sacramental for myself. But sometimes by wearing a medal outwardly, it's a sacramental for other people. Maybe you go to a school where it's a public school and they don't talk about religion there, but you're wearing your Virgin Mary image. It's like walking around with a Virgin Mary image everywhere you go. Maybe your teacher is anti-Catholic, anti-Christian. They're always talking about in history how the Christians did this and the Christians did that. 
And then there you go. Hi, teacher. I finished my paper. Hi, teacher. I brought you a gift card. And then there you are. And all the teacher sees is the Virgin Mary being nice to her. That's powerful. That's a powerful witness. Maybe there's an individual who is considering suicide. Maybe they're saying, God, I've been abandoned. You don't love me. Oh, my life is terrible. I just want to exit this life. And they're thinking, maybe I'm going to go home tonight and take my own life. But then they, and they drop their bags. They say, see, even my bags are dropped. I have the worst luck ever. And then you say, here, ma'am, here's your bags. And they look up at you and they see your medal. And it's just glowing in their eyes. The sunlight hits it just right. And then it's like, oh. And they say, oh, it's a sign. God does not want me to die. It's a Virgin Mary it's at my side. So many people in my life, you don't understand how many people. I go to HEB, they say, oh, I love your medallion. What, who is that on your medallion? And I say, oh, it's the Virgin Mary. I go to Macy's, they say, sir, that is a beautiful piece of jewelry you're wearing. I go to get my hair cut, and they say, sir, why are you wearing that such a holy, holy picture? Is that Mama Mary? And everybody's talking to me about it, and I don't even think about it. I forget that I'm wearing it, to be honest with you. It's really a sacramental to be seen by other people for their grace, for their conversion. Mary said, wear this around the neck, confidently, outwardly. So I encourage you to wear your miraculous medal. It's harder. Let's say you're a little bit embarrassed. Is it better for you to take it off in an embarrassing situation or to tuck it in? It's better for you to tuck it in. And similarly with the brown scapular. I like to compare this to my wedding ring. You might want to go somewhere where, you know, I'm going to take off the brown scapular because uh, it's, I'm going to do something sinful. Let me take it off. Uh, bad idea. Similarly, would I take off my wedding ring because I'm embarrassed? I don't want people to know that I have a wife. I don't want people to know that I love the Virgin Mary. Would my wife be happy with me if I took off my wedding ring and was going around? No, I'd be in trouble. Similarly, not like the mother of God's going to punish you, but she's not going to be happy if you're taking off things because you're embarrassed of her. Okay. Now, finally, I'm going to, about the miraculous medal, I gave you a little pamphlet. Any of these things, if you want to convert somebody, I'm going to give you a hint. This is Maximilian Colby. He would say, giving medals, convincing people to wear medals, convincing people to wear scapulars, Convincing people to have a Marian devotion is the best way to obtain their conversion. Why? Because it's not you doing it, it's Mary. And Mary's a mediatrix of all graces. So if you want to convert somebody, do whatever it takes to get them to wear the scapular. If you want to convert somebody, get them to do whatever it takes to wear the medal. And they will be converted sooner or later. But here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to give away your medal. I don't want you to give away your scapular. That's mistake number one. The devil does not like these things. He wants you to give it away. Let's say, for example, you left this talk and you're like, oh, my brother is so bad. He really needs this more than me. And then you take it off and you say, will you wear this for me? Sure. For two seconds. And then he puts it somewhere else and he never wears it. Now, you both don't have a scapular. Way to go, smarty. I could say dummy, but that's not nice. Way to go, smarty. It's kind of like you're in a spiritual war. You're in a battle, and you have only one gun. If you're trying to save everybody, you don't say, here, you take my gun. And then you're going to be left with no weapons. You're going to be gone. So don't give away your stuff. If you want to convince somebody, you go and you buy one for them for their first communion. You buy one for them for their confirmation. And you say, please wear this. And then you get them a little booklet that explains it, like this little booklet on the brown scapular. Then you get them a little pamphlet, like this one on the miraculous medal. And you say, please wear it. That's how you convert people. You'll convert more people that way than any other way. I promise the Virgin Mary will work. She converted me. She'll convert them. Now, finally... We've got more to give out. The last, the greatest, the best of the Marian sacramentals, but also the hardest. So will you please hand out a rosary to everybody? And I could use some help. You want to help me? Okay, first and foremost, we're going to talk about the rosary. 
This is the absolute hardest of all the Marian devotions, but it is the most fruitful and it has the most promises. First, what is the rosary? If you've, most of you have already seen one, know it, maybe you prayed at home, but just in case, we're going to discuss it briefly. The rosary is compiled, comprised of beads and string and a crucifix. Sometimes there's metals. These are just beads and strings and a crucifix. The, the beads that are like different colored and bigger, those are our father beads. All the other little beads are Hail Mary beads. But the rosary is more than just a compilation of Our Fathers and Hail Marys. It's got three types of prayer. It's got vocal prayer, the words you say. It's got meditative prayer, the things you should be thinking about. And it helps you to enter more deeply into contemplation. This is the thing that the devil hates more than any other devotion that you could ever imagine. And it's so powerful. Why is it so powerful? Because what it's made of, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But what is the number one problem? If you open up your pamphlet, please open up your pamphlet. The number one thing that people say about the rosary. Where is that in the Bible? I, that, more than anything else, drives me crazy. Where is the, the rosary's not in the Bible. Why do you people do the rosary? Open your pamphlet. Take a quick look at the pictures. The rosary is the Bible. All the prayers, first of all, our Father comes from the Bible. It's the most important prayer because Jesus himself taught it. The Hail Mary comes from the Bible. Also, the words of the angel came from God. He only said what God, he's a messenger of God. Hail Mary, full of grace. That's in the Bible. Blessed are you amongst women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That's from the Bible. All the mysteries that we're praying, the things we should be meditating upon. Look, it's the entire life of Jesus. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary. Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth. The birth of the child Jesus. Jesus is presented in the temple. They find Jesus in the temple. Jesus is baptized. The wedding feast at Cana. Jesus proclaims the kingdom through his public ministry. Jesus' transfiguration. Jesus institutes the Eucharist. Jesus' agony in the garden. Jesus is scourged at the pillar. Jesus is crowned with thorns. This is all Bible. That's why it's so powerful. That's why the devil hates it. It's Mary bringing us to Jesus. Yes, we do say a lot of Hail Marys. But why? Partly to keep time and space. But, but the words Hail Mary are the most important words ever uttered in all of human history because that was the beginning of the end. It is through the annunciation of the angel Gabriel to the Blessed Virgin Mary that changed the course of human history. And so we are looking at this in light of that. So it is very good to say our fathers and Hail Marys. But what is more important, what the rosary really is, is that we should be meditating upon the mystery at each one of these decades. That's difficult to do, I admit. How would I do this? So let's say you, there's like there's the Apostles' Creed, you gotta do the Our Father, Three Hail Marys, Glory Be, etc. But this is really the heart. This big loop is really the heart of the rosary. You go to the first mystery, you say, the first joyful mystery is the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel announces to the Virgin Mary. You picture it in your mind, you have some intention. Mary knows we are selfish. Everything that we do, we do because we want something. We do because we want to be happy. So if I'm going to pray the rosary, it's not because the rosary is fun, because it's not. Sorry. And I love the rosary and I pray it regularly, daily, many a day. But it's not because it's fun. It's because I want something. I want to be happy. And this brings me what I'm wanting. So I would as an incentive, every decade that you pray, picture it in your mind first, then think of something that you want. So on the way here, I prayed the Annunciation. I said, Lord, help me to announce to these young people the messages that you have for them. And then I prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I go, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And every once in a while, I would remind myself, oh yeah, Annunciation, I should be imagining this. And then you do the next one. 
Okay, the, the visitation. Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth. I cared a lot about helping you. So I said, Lord, help me when I visit these young people to speak and let the Holy Spirit stir inside of them like it's stirred inside of St. Elizabeth. So the same thing. What do you want? I want to get into a good college. Okay, Lord, announce to me that I'm going to get into a good college. Visit me with good grades. Have the Holy Spirit stir in me like it's stirred in Elizabeth. Help me to hear your voice. Help me to hear the right answers to my test. You do this. I know that sounds like your motive isn't pure. But none of, nothing that we do is out of pure motive. We go to church. Why? Because we want to be happy. Why? Because I want to go to heaven. Everything we do is because we want something else. That's natural. God uses, uh, takes us where we're at. I might be doing my prayers because I don't want my uncle to die. Or I don't want my, my mom to be uh, left alone without a husband. or with, with, I don't want my dad to lose his job. I might be praying because of that. But God reaches me where I'm at. He uses that to purify my heart. That's what prayer does. Even when it's selfish, it's good for us. So all of this is sacred scripture, and that's where the power comes. The Bible is the inspired word of God. If I were to take the Bible and read the gospel real slow and repeat the words over and over again, my soul would start to be moved. We hear about this when prisoners go to jail and they say, Oh, I found Jesus in jail. I was reading the Bible. Oh, I was in a hotel room and I read the Bible and it was coming alive and I'm a Christian now. Wow. The same thing happens when you pray the rosary. It's hard work at first. It really is. But by meditating on the prayers, by repeating the words, the Hail Mary, eventually the Holy Spirit begins to stir up in you and you get good ideas. And then you'll think, oh, wow. Oh, I never thought of that before. And then even more importantly, you encounter God through it. It's tough. It really is. It, it might not be tough sometimes. Sometimes you might be like, I feel like God is with me. I feel like it's so powerful in my soul. But for me, most of the time, I have to force myself to do it. But after I'm done, I feel much better. And I know I have God with me. And that no matter what happens, God is going to make everything that's happening in my life work for my good. This is the most important investment that you can make in your life. There's, um, the book I gave you, it says that convincing somebody to pray the rosary, it's on page 12 actually, I think, I don't remember the page to be honest. Convincing somebody to pray the rosary, you don't have to open it now, I'm going to talk about it specifically, but he says, St. Louis de Montfort says, convincing somebody to pray the rosary does more good for them than hearing all these wonderful sermons because it changes my habits. So we have a natural inclination on a daily basis to be selfish, to be lustful, to be angry, to be gluttonous, to be lazy. But by praying the rosary every day, we are committing ourselves to Jesus Christ. It's creating discipline within us and it's making Mary is our mediatrix and is our intercessor. So all of the saints prayed the rosary. Everybody who wants to be close to Jesus, by praying the rosary with Mary, you have a special relationship that cannot be substituted. I know many people who are very holy and their main devotion is the rosary. Everything is contained in there because it's got the entire life of Jesus. It is hard, but you can do it, but you have to be tough. Do you want to be in sin the rest of your life? Do you want to have the addictions that you have? Do you want to be a slave to lust? Do you want to be a slave to doubt or to insecurities in your life? The rosary will help you to overcome every weakness. It will be able to be your guide and your light. Look at these, this paper. You might have a blue one like this. I have the white one. I use the white one because it's easier for me to read. But take out that paper. It's so good for us that the Virgin Mary is going to give many promises to us if we do it. Why? It might seem like bribery, but she's smart. She's willing to give us things that we need to get us to commit to praying the rosary because it's so important for our souls. So what are some of these promises? Number one, I live off the, these. Number one, whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. Faithfully, that means 
frequently, that means doing it consistently, by the recitation of the rosary, shall receive signal graces. A signal grace is a sign. Some people say, well, that's just a great grace. That's not what signal grace means. No, great grace is the next one. We'll talk about that. A signal grace is signs, inspirations. So, for example, I mentioned that my laptop got stolen when I was giving that talk. I prayed, I said, because I knew, I, I noticed something. It was stolen the very second that I saved it. I was in Brazil because I wanted to give the best presentation. And the moment that I hit save on the presentation, it was taken from me. That's not a coincidence. When you see something that is not a coincidence, that the odds are one in a million, what are the odds that I would have my laptop stolen, my presentation stolen the second I hit save? by a gunman, one and a million. So anytime the odds are like one in a million, you can say, okay, God, what do you want? That's a sign. So I went to the church. I said, Lord, you're sabotaging me. You're destroying my life. <laughs> and, he, and in my heart, I felt, it's not that I heard a voice. God speaks to you in your heart. If you'll only stop and ask. In my heart, he was saying, they stole your presentation. They did not steal my presentation. You are going to give your presentation. That's not the presentation I wanted you to give. What presentation did he want me to give? I said, Lord, what do you want me to give then? I've got nothing. He says, you've got, what do you got? I said, nothing. And I said in my hand, the rosary. You've got the rosary. What do you got? All I got is my scapular. I've got my medals, all of them. That's what you have, that's what you give them, that's the message I want you to give them. And that presentation was one of the best presentations ever, because it was His will. But I had to recognize the sign, the signal. In your own life, if you pray the rosary regularly, you will get signals, you will get signs. For example, I always say no when people want me to speak. Why? because it's hard and because I prefer to make YouTube videos where I can edit out all of my mistakes, edit out all of my pauses to make me look so great. Whereas here I come and I was like, okay, what was I going to say? Uh, 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 okay. But she contacted me about talking on May 13th. Somebody else had just contacted me from a Cyril Malabar church saying, will you give a talk to my young people? And I said, can I talk about Mary? And their pastor said, no, I don't want you to talk about Mary. I want you to talk about something else. She contacted me the same day. Cyril Malabar Church. Can you talk on May 13th? What's your church? St. Mary. Can I talk about Mary? Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> I took it as a sign. You. You might be saying, well, where do I go to college? Should I go to Texas A&M or should I go to University of St. Thomas? My, my, my parents are Aggies. They'd love if I became an Aggie. And then, but in your heart you feel like something about St. Thomas has always been interesting. You always like that Saint St. Thomas. And so you've been praying the rosary. Your parents really want you to become Aggies. You're driving down the street, you see a St. Thomas bumper sticker. Then you go into Target, and the guy in front of you has a St. Thomas t-shirt. And then you go into your house, and you get a phone call, and the caller ID, it says, Virgin Islands, St. Thomas Islands. And you say, whoa, 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 this is, God's trying to speak to me, right? Okay, that would be a sign. Sometimes it's not so magnificent. Sometimes it's something very, very small that only you notice, but it touches you in your heart. Mary promises you signal graces if you do this. Okay, pray the rosary. I live off these. I need confirmations. I need consolations. I shouldn't, but I'm weak. And Although I use these as an incentive, eventually by my committing to pray the rosary, it will purify my soul of my selfish inclinations. Number two, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all of those who shall recite the rosary. Special protection. John Paul II. So Our Lady at Fatima asked many things. She wanted Russia to be consecrated. Many of the popes did not obey Our Lady's request. 
uh, the popes, they just ignored it. John Paul II also was ignoring it. Except on May 13th, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, the anniversary of Fatima, he was shot <laughs> by a gun. And he, he prayed the rosary, he wore the scapular, but he said, wait a second, is this a coincidence? I'm shot on Our Lady of Fatima. I have, not, I have not done what Our Lady of Fatima has asked me. After that, he said, there's no doubt in my mind that that protection that I had, because the, the guy who shot him shot him very close. He was an excellent marksman. He was shooting to kill. And the bullets somehow, although they went straight through his chest, missed all the vital organs. And John Paul II said, I knew I was going to live because although one finger was pulling the trigger, I knew another finger was directing the bullet, the finger of the Virgin Mary. And so he knew he was going to live because he had special protection and the greatest graces. And after that, he became more devoted to Our Lady of Fatima. But you also need special protection. So many times you can be in a car accident and... and You'll, you'll have the wheel turn and protect you just at the right moment. Or maybe you're walking down the road. This is possible. You're walking down the road and it is the intention of some men down the street to jump out and rob you. And you don't know it. But then all of a sudden a dog comes barking. And you say, oh, this dog, ah, I got across the street. There's a wild dog by this house. And then you walk and you're safe. And little did you know, had you kept walking on that path, these men would have jumped you and abducted you or taken your money, and you're protected. Where did that dog come from? In the lives of the saints, especially St. John Bosco, there was a dog that would always jump out and protect him at the last minute. And he said that this dog was his guardian angel. He'd call it El Garigio because the dog was gray. That means the gray one, the gray dog would protect him. And that could be in your life. That could have been your guardian angel scurrying you across. Or that could be divine providence. We all need special protection. Special protection for our souls and for our bodies, for our families, and for our health, etc. Number three, the rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice, decrease sin, and defeat heresies. Decrease sin. Protect you from the wickedness and snares of the devil. If you're addicted to pornography, are you going to be addicted your whole life? Yes, you will. Why? If you do the same thing over and over again, it's never going to change. If you're addicted to gluttony, eating, 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 eating. If you're addicted to uh, bulimic, you eat so much and then you vomit. You're going to keep that unless there's something that stops it. What's going to stop our habit of sin? Mary's intercession. There's some great holy people who say, you will either give up the rosary or you'll give up your sin. One of the other important things we're going to skip through. I want you to see this one. Those who are faithful to the recitation of the rosary shall during their life and at their death have the light of God and the plenitude of His graces. They shall not die without the sacraments of the church. Think about this. I'm saying, Mary, pray for me now and at the hour of my death 50 times. Let's say I say a thousand rosaries during my lifetime. That's 50,000 Hail Marys asking Mary to pray for me now and at the most important moment that I will ever experience and that's when I die. So when you die, it will be like having 50,000 Hail Marys coming down upon you. And what you need to realize is that every single day of your life, you're getting closer to death. Many people don't like to think about death, but we have to face it. We need to accept it, that this is a natural part of life. And we have to be prepared. And the best way to prepare is by having all of these Hail Marys that we've prayed throughout our life shower down upon us at the hour of our death. Also, Mary promises that you shall obtain all you ask of me by the recitation of the rosary. What is it that you want? Think about it. What, what would it take for me to get you to pray the rosary every single day? You have to want something. You have to love somebody. There has to be some incentive. What would it take? 
What is it that you hold most dear in your life that you'd be willing to pray the rosary every single day? Think of it. What would it be? What is it? Mary's promising. Number nine. No, no, number, number nine. See how dumb I am? This is why I do videos so I can edit all this out, but I'm not going to edit it out. Number 12. No. See how dumb I am? Uh, number 11. That's the one. You shall obtain all you ask of me by the recitation of the rosary. All you ask, as long as it's not going to lead you astray. What is it that you want? Please think of it. What do you love? Who do you care about? If you don't care about your own soul, who do you love that you want to save? If you have a family member who might go to hell, wouldn't you at least pray the rosary for them? What would it take? Do you want to go to a good school? Do you want to impress your parents? Do you, what, what? I don't know. Even if it's selfish, think of something and commit to praying the rosary. Use that as your incentive. Please. That's what Mary's basically saying. She's saying, please, I'll, I'll, I'll offer you anything. Please just do it. Because souls are going to hell. And part of the rosary is that it's tough. That is the sacrifice, the discipline that it takes. But after you're done, you're thankful you prayed it. That's the amazing part, is that before we pray it, we're reluctant. We wait to the last minute. Okay, fine, I'll do it. But then afterwards, we're like, well, that was good. I'm glad I did that. I feel better. Look at me. I prayed the rosary today. You sinners, you never pray. You pagans. It's true, we do that. I do that too. But little do I admit that it's like pulling my teeth to get me to do it. Okay, fine. I'll pray. But you have to understand is that the devil doesn't want you to pray. So he's going to use a couple of tricks to keep you to praying. So I'm going to give you these tricks. I'm going to give you the wrist rosary and then we'll be done with our talk. One thing he's going to say is do it later. So I forgot to mention at the beginning of my talk, that although there are extraordinary occasions that the devil works, the ordinary one is through ordinary everyday temptation, through little voices in our head, little tugging saying, nah, you don't need to do that. Rationalize. Do it later. You're busy right now. Pray tomorrow. You went to the retreat today. That's enough. You don't need to pray the rosary today. Pray tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, eh, that was just yesterday. That was just a religious thing. Maybe on Sundays. And then already, with one little thought, it wasn't scary, it's gone, your devotion. He'll say, do it tonight. You wait, wait before bed when you can have peace. But I guarantee you, no human being in the history of the world who has ever laid down to pray the rosary did not fall asleep. <laughs> Why? It can be that you have insomnia and you never sleep. But when you lay down with the rosary and you start saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> the devil himself will be sitting there. Lullaby, go to sleep. Ah, da, da. I'll give you a massage. <laughs> so relaxed. Why? Because you fall asleep and then you don't pray it. Do not wait till the end. Of, if you're going to wait till the end of the day, this is how you pray it. Because no man ever has fallen asleep kneeling. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I take it back. I should not say that. <laughs> They're always an exception. Have you been, maybe if you're kneeling like, could you fall asleep like this? No, because you'll bust your face. <laughs> Unless you have like a, a stick in your shirt holding you straight up. All right. So don't wait to the last minute. Because what will happen is you will put it off and then say tomorrow. Also, another good reason is you don't need help asleep. You need help throughout the day. Every day when you wake up, you're starting fresh. When you hit the so you could have been like, I'm so holy at night, I'm having visions of God. And then the alarm goes off in the morning. Oh my God, I'm late for school. Oh, I gotta do this. Oh, I can't talk, Mom, I can't pray. I gotta go, 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 go. and run. And then you're at school and you're like, blah, blah, or work. And you're like, your brain is work, 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 work. Succeed, succeed, fun, relax. And the, all these things in your mind. But if you prayed the rosary in the morning or in the daytime or on your way home from work, then you'll have the grace of God with you all throughout the day. I'm so busy though, man. I can't pray in the morning. Look, you, can, you don't have to do it all at once. That's another lie that happens. You can pray one decade in the morning on your way to school, one decade at lunchtime, one decade on the way home from school, one decade before dinner or after dinner, one decade before bed, because then you'll really finish. It's only one decade. 
Do, do you understand? You don't have to do it all at once. And it's better. Now, I'm saying one decade. You want to be a real hero? I'll tell you, John Paul II prayed, I think, four rosaries every day. There's, in this book, they brag about the saints who prayed three rosaries every day. They brag about them. It takes 20 minutes. If you can do one 20-minute rosary, you are already one-third of the saints. That's easy. You want to be a great saint? Do three a day. Or four a day, you'll be better than even the greatest saints. Could you imagine? St. John? Wow. St. John of Pearland? Wow. That could be you. <laughs> it's true. It's easy. They became holy not by bo being born saints. They were ordinary people like you and me, but it was through their Marian devotion and their devotion to the Most Holy Eucharist that made them who they are today. God takes ordinary people like me and you and uses our prayers to glorify Him. You're only as holy as your prayer life. That's all. You, people say, well, praying helps your relationship with God. That's boo-boo. Prayer is your relationship with God. And you make your everyday life a prayer. So don't wait. Please commit. Please. I gave you this book called The Secret of the Rosary. This book is like gold. Please read it. Please. I'm begging you. Read it. It's... If you don't want to read it from cover to cover, just flip through it and find a paragraph or a chapter and then read it. it. It's more than just about the rosary. The rosary encompasses everything about your Christian faith. It covers spiritual warfare. It covers the life of Jesus. It covers Marian dogmas. It's, it's, it's amazing. Next, I gave you a wrist rosary. Why do I have this wrist rosary? couple of reasons. One, because I always have a rosary on me at all times, no matter what. Do not leave home without the rosary. It's more important than American Express. You don't leave home without it. Always have the rosary on or with you. Many times women especially don't have pockets. All you do is you hang it over your arm just like this. You put the crucifix through the hole and then you wrap it around and then you tuck it in like that. Another reason why men especially have a difficulty keeping their hands to themselves. They get in so much trouble by touching things that they should not. They touch women that they should not be touching. They take things that they should not be taking. They hit people they should not be hitting. They can't keep their hands to themselves. And sometimes their problem is they keep having their hands all over themselves. But if you have the rosary on your wrist, you're less likely to commit any sins. Why? Because there I am. I'm about to steal some uh, nice pens, gel pens. And then I see, oh, I got Jesus on my wrist. I probably should not do that. There I am with my girlfriend. Hey, honey, give me a little smooch. <laughs> and then she says, okay, watch your traveling hands, young man. Okay, I got Jesus on my hands. I'm not going to touch, put my hands where I should not be putting them. All right, so this is very helpful for that. It also reminds me to pray the rosary. It's another reason why I gave you this picture of the Virgin Mary. Because one day, you're not going to want to pray, and you're going to walk by this picture, and she's going to say, Come on, I'm giving you my heart. Pray the rosary and wear your scapula. Okay. This can and will change your life. God has a plan for your life. You know in your heart that you're special. You know in your heart that God has something special planned for your life. But what's going to happen is we're going to ruin it. We ruin our own lives when we commit sin. We get in the way of God's plan when we're selfish, when we're greedy, when we're anxious, when we don't trust. We do. We ruin God's plan. God could have great plans for us to do amazing things. To, to really impact people's lives. But because our lack of faith, we ruin it. Because we don't have time to be, be still and hear the voice of God speaking in our conscience. What the rosary does is it forces you to be still. The scapular forces you to think about death and what you want out of life. The miraculous medal forces you to be publicly a good person because you represent all of your Christian faith. 
if it helps you. These are things that help you to become the best version of yourself. You need good habits. If you want to be successful in, in, in sports, you have to practice every day. You have to stay fit. If you want to be successful in school, you have to stay on your books. You have to stay disciplined. If you want to be as, as successful in the spiritual life, the most important thing is going to heaven. You can have a PhD and go to hell. You can be the best athlete and burn in hell. But also you can be an ignorant child and be canonized a great saint just because you are faithful to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And you will know in your heart that you are doing the will of God. God has a plan maybe for you to marry a specific person so that you can have a lot of children and raise them to be great saints and maybe one of them will be the Pope. Maybe one of them will cure cancer. But because of your own weakness, you give in to sinful temptations and you are doing premarital activities, sexual activities, because you're weak and I can't help it. But when you do these premarital activities, you become attached to the person. And maybe that's not the right person for you. Maybe God is calling you to be a priest or a nun. But because of your sinful attachments, you don't hear the voice of God calling you. And you don't know how many souls He has planned for you to touch. But Mary, if you go with her, if you authentically give your life to her, if you keep her with you, she is a good mother. She will say, that man is no good for you. I'm going to sabotage you. Your mom might not like your boyfriend if you're a girl or your girlfriend if you're a boy. But she can't sabotage you. She can speak out against it. But the Virgin Mary has the power to sabotage you. She does. In my life, she has sabotaged me many times to keep me from doing things that were bad for me. And I pray that she sabotages you and gets you to pray. We're going to end with a prayer. So I keep saying you have to give your life to the Virgin Mary, give your life to Jesus. We're going to end with a consecration prayer. You can keep this. I appreciate all of your patience, all of your love, all of your attention. Y'all have been so good to me. So once you have this prayer, we'll kneel down. We'll get on one knee, just like when you love somebody. You get on your knee and say, I give you my life, baby, will you marry me? Well, we're going to say to the Virgin Mary, Virgin Mary, I give you my life, will you please help me? All right, so go ahead and kneel down. We're going to pray this together slowly. Try to mean it. You'll notice that it has a big, large, blank space. At that point, you say your own name. We're going to pray this slowly together, out loud. You join me. And you say your own name. I'm going to say Gabriel. You don't say Gabriel unless your name is Gabriel. Got it? All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I, Gabriel, a repentant sinner, renew and ratify today in your hands, O Immaculate Mother, the vows of my baptism. I renounce Satan and resolve to follow Jesus Christ even more closely than before. Mary, I give you my heart. Please set it on fire with love for Jesus. Make it always attentive to his burning thirst for love and for souls. Keep my heart in your most pure heart, that I may love Jesus and the members of his body with your own perfect love. Mary, I entrust myself totally to you, my body, my soul, my goods, both interior and exterior, and even the value of all my good actions. Please make of me, of all that I am and have, whatever most pleases you. Let me be a fit instrument in your immaculate and merciful hands for bringing the greatest possible glory to God. If I fall, please lead me back to Jesus. Wash me in the blood and water that flow from his pure side and help me never to lose my trust in this fountain of love and mercy. With you, O Immaculate Mother, you who always do the will of God, I unite myself to the perfect consecration of Jesus as he offers himself in the Spirit to the Father for the life of the world. Amen. And may all glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all, my friends. Pray the rosary. Wear the brown scapular. And put your pictures up in your room.